Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, really, I would like to thank my dear friend, Dr. Banshi Sabu, for giving me a chance to talk on this very obnoxious topic. Because Banshi talked about all the metabolic parameters, he talked about the cardiometabolic complications, he talked about the cardiovascular disease, but he left this obnoxious topic for me, <laughs> which obviously nobody wants to talk about. Now, before I start giving my talk, can I have a show of hands? How many of you actually deal? This is the agenda for today's talk. So I'm going to talk about the, first of all, a little bit of a recap about the anatomy and the pathophysiology of the autonomic bladder. I'll talk about the diabetic cystopathy again, the basics. I'll start with the basics and then go on to the next steps. We'll talk about how we're going to evaluate the diabetic cystopathy and what about finally a few words about the management. But suffice it to say that this is actually one of the least discussed topics. Even if you look at the ADA guidelines, they've just spared one paragraph for the management of this condition, nothing more than that. So basically a little bit about the anatomy and pathophysiology of the autonomic bladder. Basically, it is a study of the entire nervous system. So basically, it starts from the brain and goes up to the peripheral nerves. So these are the certain areas of the brain which are active actually. For example, this control of the bladder function starts from the frontal cortex. And right now, thanks to the advanced radionuclear imaging, we have found out there are certain areas of the brain. For example, the insular area, certain areas like the uh, frontal operculum. These are the areas which are actually involved in bringing down signals to the pons. The pons is the actual area which controls your bladder function. So how does it control? The frontal lobe sends in the inhibitory signals down to the pons for the control of the bladder. In other words, it prevents the bladder from relaxing and voiding out the urine and preventing a very embarrassing situation in the public life. So basically, this frontal lobe sends in the inhibitory signals and in pons we have got the spontane micturition center or the PMC which is a major relay or excitatory center, and this is something which coordinates the urinary sphincters and the bladder. It is affected by emotions. So obviously when you're stressed enough, if you're upset, you can be incontinent, or you can be too much stressed, you can be completely going to a sort of a complete retention mode. Then we have got the spinal cord, particularly the S2 to S4 segments, which acts as an intermediary be between the upper and the lower control. We have got the peripheral nervous system, and there, there, are, there are three components. One is a parasympathetic system, one is a sympathetic system, and the other one is a somatic system. Now, the parasympathetic basically is through the pelvic splanchnic nerves, S2 to S4, sympathetic to T10 to 12, uh, L2 segments, that's the hypogastric nerves, and also the somatic nerves, which is basically through the pudendal nerves, which brings out the excitatory or the external uh, sphincter control. Now, basically, this is what the basic pathophysiology is, that the intrinsic, the filling of the urinary bladder, it basically depends upon two factors. One is the intrinsic viscoelastic property of the bladder, and the second one is the inhibition of this parasympathetic nervous system. We all remember from a physiology days the stress or the stress, uh, st uh, phenomena when the sympathetic nervous system is there. We are in a stress situation. So basically, but that is a normal situation for a bladder. We want to prevent the incontinence from happening. So the sympathetic system has to go into an overdrive mode to prevent that evacuation of the bladder from happening. So the sympathetic nervous system, basically it triggers the bladder contractions. It directly causes the relaxation and expansion of the detrusor muscle so that the bladder can expand and accommodate more urine. And it closes the bladder neck by constricting the internal urethral sphincter. Now this sympathetic input is a constant during the active bladder filling. As the bladder fills up more, there is an increased stimulus by the pudendal nerve to the external urethral sphincter. So the pressure of the external sphincter goes up and this contraction of the external sphincter coupled with the internal sphincter, it maintains the urethral pressure. The normal state, this urethral sphincter pressure has to be more than the bladder pressure to prevent the incontinence from happening. And as long as the urethral pressure is more than the bladder pressure, the patient is continent. Whenever it turns around, the other things happen. So basically, the storage mode basically is the sympathetic nervous system, and the void mode is basically through the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the pontine micturition center, basically, it's the pr principal uh, modulator, as I told you, of the micturition pathway. And through this uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and the cholinergic nerves from the ONOFS nucleus, basically, it forms a sacral plexus around the S2-S4 via the pudendal nerves, and it, this is something which is controlled by the pontine continent center. So the pudendal nerves as a voluntary control center for prevention of the incontinence. This, in summary, actually gives you uh, 
a role of exactly how the things happen. But right now, there have been certain good studies which have shown that there is a role of a corticotropin releasing hormone or the CRH on the spontine micturition center. So if you're CRH deficient, the spontine micturition center ceases to be that much effective. There have been some animal studies. What are the implications in real life? We still do not know. Now, if you're talking about the autonomic bladder, I know this is a session on diabetes, but we should not forget that there are lots of other non-diabetic causes and they can be broadly divided into three groups. One is the supraspinal lesions, the spinal lesions, or the peripheral nerve lesions. So all of these can cause uh, uh, an autonomic bladder. Now, diabetes, though, have put it primarily in the peripheral nerve lesion group. What is important is to bear in mind the fact that diabetes can happen, affect your continence at each and every stage. It can affect in the supraspinal stage. It can happen in the spinal stage as well as in the peripheral nerve lesion. Now, what are the clinical presentations of the autonomic bladder? This is actually an entire plethora of presentations. So it could be an overactive detrusor, it could be an impaired detrusor, or it could be a complete areflexia of the detrusor. That means the detrusor simply doesn't work. And so the detrusor compliance, as we can conclude from there, it could be normal, increased, or decreased. And the similar other thing, because these are the two components, one is the detrusor component and the other is the sphincter component. The internal sphincter could be competent, it could be incompetent, it could be dyssynergic. So there could be a complete lack of synergy between the external sphincter and the internal sphincter. And there could be external sphincter can go into sort of a fixed stone, something which happens in patients with diabetes and prosthetic hypertrophy. So these patients they have got a fixed stone of the external urethral sphincter, which prevents the sphincter from relaxing even when the bladder is overfull. Now, certain salient points to note that when the neurological lesions are above the brainstem level, what happens is that involuntary blood bladder contractions with coordinated sphincter function. And the urinary incontinence may occur due to detrusor overactivity in such situation. So there are different ways by which it can present. Number two, if the patient has got a spinal lesion between T6 and S2, there is an involuntary bladder contractions without any sensation. So the sensation is gone but the bladder is contracting on its own in an autonomic way. When there's a complete spinal lesion above T6, there is a smooth sphincter dyssynergia, autonomic hyperreflexia, incontinence due to detrusor overactivity. So in all of these, when it's a spinal lesion, it's primarily a case of detrusor overacting. It's not that of a sphincter problem in that extent. Relatively, the sphincter problem comes as a secondary problem. Uh, if it's a spinal trauma, again, there is a detrusor, a reflexia, low bladder compliance, and an open and smooth sphincter. So the patient just becomes incontinent. And when it's a peripheral nerve lesion, as it happens in diabetes, there is a detrusor, reflexia, stroke hyperreflexia, there's a low bladder compliance, incompetent smooth sphincter, and a residual fixed stone of the striated sphincter, that is the external sphincter, which is not amenable to voluntary relaxation. Now, this is a busy slide, but this gives an idea of how the different Passes of this incontinence can contribute actually to the autonomic uh, dysfunction that you find in the different conditions that I've talked about. Let us now move on to diabetic cystopathy. What about the basics? So basically, this diabetic cystopathy, this term was first coined by Fremont Moller in 1976, and it is classically described as a reduced blood sensation and elevated threshold for initiating the micturition reflex, and this is the earlier symptoms of the diabetic cystopathy. There is a poor contractility due to damaged visceral afferent fibers of the bladder wall. And there is, as a consequence, there is an increased post void residual urine. And on top of that, this usually happens in a patient of long standing diabetes, usually at least 5 to 10 years diabetes with suspected or established autonomic neuropathy. The majority of the patients who have got an autonomic bladder, they've got either a significant peripheral neuropathy or an autonomic neuropathy is present. Now, how do you confirm the diagnosis? Basically, the gold standard for diagnosis is basically urodynamics and uroflow. I must admit this is something which I do not understand. So if I've got a problem, I refer them to the urological colleagues to provide me the necessary inputs. And basically by the measurement of the post-void residual urine. Now, how common is this condition, the prevalence, as per some of the studies that I've quoted down there, the overall prevalence in all diabetes patients is between 37 to 50% mostly in females, between 25 to 90 percent, and particularly in type 1 diabetes patients where the prevalence is between 43 to 87 percent. Now, these figures, as you can see, there's very wide ranges. Now, why is this so? Because most of the studies which have been quoted here, 
they're not validated studies. This is just anecdotal studies done by different people looking at different sorts of sets of cohorts. And basically, not all of them produce the same criteria for diagnosing the blood or cystopathy. And this was actually, this is actually is a reflection of the heterogeneous uh, population base on which these studies were undertaken. So what is the basic pathophysiology of the diabetic cystopathy? So these are the changes which happens. So there's a change in the physiology of the detrusor muscle due to a chronic hyperglycemia. HbA1c above 8.5 has been shown to have a significant correlation with the development of long-term autonomic bladder. Uh, these muscles, they have got an increased response to the muscarinic agents, probably due to an increase in the muscarinic receptor density in the bladder. And uh, they're also increasingly sensitive to calcium. The other important thing which plays a role because, because of this uh, instable detrusor, the bladder goes on into a stretch mode, leads to an increased intravesical pressure. The transport of the nerve growth factor to the lumbosacral dorsal root ganglia. And last but not the least, this is very important. We all know that diabetes patients are susceptible to recurrent urinary tract infection. A recurrent urinary tract infection damages the bladder urothelium and leads to an E. coli penetration, which alters the musculoendothelial structure of the bladder. And this is something which in the long run promotes uh, the autonomic decompensation. Now, how do the diabetic cystopathy differ from the non-diabetic cystopathy? Basically, compared to the non-diabetic cystopathy, the diabetic patients have got an increased nocturia score a weaker urinary stream, less voided volumes, reduced maximal flow rates, and increased residual post uh, volume post evacuation. In fact, if you want to diagnose a diabetic cystopathy, basically if the residual volume is more than 150 ml and the patient does not have any other conditions like an obstructive uropathy, I think the diagnosis is made. That is one of the diagnostic criteria. And urinary continence is present. It's 50 to 200 percent more than in a non-diabetic individual. And diabetic peripheral neuropathy is an important interpretive contributor in the re reduced emptying of the bladder, as we all know. So how does a diabetic cystopathy present? It's asymptomatic in the vast majority of patients. But if you look at the symptom-wise, the commonest symptoms is the detrusor hyperreflexia, which is present in around 55% patients, reduced detrusor contractility in around 23%, and complete reflexia in around 10% patients. So the patients present an urgency with or without incontinence. And there is an increased percentage of bladder outlet obstruction in such patients in the diabetic cystopathy. And this arch incontinence is again one of the reflections of the microvascular damage to the bladder mucosal membrane. Now incontinence, this has been seen in several studies that this incontinence can actually predate the appearance of diabetes, particularly in middle-aged women. This is a wonderful study done by Lee et al., the one which I've quoted there. They basically found out that around in, this was a very small study, around 150 odd patients. But what they found out there was that in a substantial majority, to say in around say 30% of the patients, these patients had presented initially with just incontinence and they did not have any other symptoms. And on workup, they were found to have newly diagnosed diabetes. So if you come across a patient who is presenting with a new onset incontinence, make sure that you get the glycemic workup done. And this incontinence, as I told you, can predate the appearance of the onset of diabetes mellitus. It could be indeterminate uh, in around 11% patients, so it may not follow any of these patterns. The other issue is basically the vesicoerythral dysfunction, that is the bladder and the urethral contractions that don't happen together. So it can happen in around 14.5% patients with an overactive bladder, loss of external uh, detrusor external sphinc sphincter coordination in around 31% patients, and a low compliance bladder in 11%. And more often than not, this is complicated by recurrent UTI because of the urinary stasis and the incoordination which happens between the bladder and the urethra. So how do you evaluate a diabetic cystopathy? Basically, just like any other conditions, you start with the history and physical examination, look out for the symptoms, and but rule out specifically cardiovascular disorders, spinal problems, if the patient has got in prosthetic hyperplasia or a vaginal prolapse. Evaluate for a new neuropathy, whether the patient has got a somatic or autonomic neuropathy. Look for the metabolic profile, like the glucose profile, sodium, potassium, creatinine. Look for the urine examinations. But the gold standard to arrive at a particular diagnosis is 
the urodynamic studies and the ultrasound of the KUB, which gives an idea regarding the bladder distension. The, the KUB ultrasound basically gives an idea regarding the bladder distension, but the more dynamic profile is provided by this urodynamic studies, like the systometrogram and simultaneous pressure flow studies and uroflow, the sphincter electromyography and evaluation of leak point pressures and measurement of the post wider urine. I'm sorry, I cannot tell you more than that because this is not my cup of tea. I do not know what these things actually mean, but this is written that these are the ones that should be investigated and usually this is best left in the hand of a urologist. But this is one picture basically of a 19-year-old man with a 19-year-old woman with a detrusor-related sphincter dysenergy. If you look at it very carefully, you can see the bladder is, is trying to contract but the external uh, urethral sphincter has gone into sort of a constricture mode. So obviously what is happening in the process, the bladder is getting distended. It's trying to pressurize, bring out the urine, but in the process what's happening, the bladder musculature is getting, you know, in a contracted state, if you follow it very, very carefully. So how do you manage diabetic cystopathy? Basically, the choice of the specific treatment, it is primarily guided by the urodynamic abnormalities. So the management goals primarily are the relief of symptoms, prevention and treatment of the urinary tract infections, and ensure adequate bladder emptying. So the management strategies are divided into three groups, behavioral, pharmacological, and surgical. So the behavioral, there are certain things, simple behavioral models which can really help in this incontinence. Weight reduction has been shown to have a significant effect on the urinary incontinence. Dietary supplementation with thiamine or cyclohexanoic long-chain fatty acids can diminish or even prevent a diabetic cystopathy. Very few studies, but studies are there. And the other important practical thing is minimize the nocturnal polyuria. Ask them to have more fluid in the early morning or in the early afternoon. Minimal fluid at bedtime. Void before going to bed. Void frequently every two to four hours. Avoid bladder irritants such as caffeinated beverages and alcohol. They should be avoided in patients who have got suspected autonomic um, bladders. And ensure adequate dietary roughage to minimize the constipation because constipation is one condition which can actually worsen this diabetic cystopathy. And then there are other exercises like the pelvic floor exercises or the Kegel exercises to strengthen the pubic oxygen muscle. This is something which obviously you can start ideally in patients whom you suspect to be at a high risk of developing an autonomic bladder. And the other creeds manual for compression, the lower abdominal valsalva manual, these also help patients. Pharmacotherapy, again, not all of them really work out very well in detrusor reflexy. In fact, nothing works in that situation. But anti-muscarinic agents like the extended release tolteridine, oxybutynin, solifenacin, dorifenacin, they have been shown to have some effect. Not big studies, not very good results, 30 to 40 percent success rate in majority of them. And particularly anticholinergic drugs with dominant anti-muscarinic actions like crospium hydrochloride, fesoteroidine, um, and uh, combined anti-mascarinic and calcium antagonist reactions like propivirin hydrochloride. Limited studies with alpha methyl dopa, phenaxobenzamine, they have been tried. Tricyclic antidepressants like imipramine has been tried in overactive blood or urinary incontinence. But again, the use is restricted by the side effects of this class of agents. Surgical treatment for in those classes of patient where no medical treatment works out, and obviously we can understand the outcome of the surgical treatment is not really that great. Selective putinal nerve blocks, vesiclinic resection in hypotonic bladder. And the one which has shown a really good promise is the sacral neuromodulation, where basically you put in some sacral nerve stimulation through external devices. And it has got a significant success rate in reducing the RG incontinence by as much as nearly 70%, urgency frequency by nearly 86%, and urinary retention reduction by around 67%. The other, the less effective one which really works out, again tried, but again, it is steep with multiple problems like, inter, like recurrent urinary, urinary tract infection is intermittent catheterization where none of these actually work out. I'm sorry. So this, in summary, actually denotes how we should try. And as you can see here, the, the management approach towards an overactive bladder versus a hypotonic bladder, it completely differs between the two classes. So the final take-home messages is that diabetic cystopathy is relatively quite common but often we are not bothered enough to take really the history. And if there's a problem, if it's a male patient, it is often dubbed to be due to a prostatic problem. We do not think that the diabetic cystopathy could be a cause for the bladder symptoms of the patient. It can be very embarrassing. It can contribute to depression if the patient is incontinent and the patient becomes very shy. 
There are different manifestations from detrusive instability to poor blood and sensation and contraction. Eurodynamic studies are the cornerstones. Lifestyle modifications such as weight reduction, diet changes, amount and timing of fluid intake and pelvic muscle training is recommended. In fact, perhaps I should say this is something which has got the best response. Pharmacotherapy has a limited role in detrusive reflexia. Some of the drugs work, but none of them work beyond 30 to 40 percent success rate. And surgical intervention could render beneficial effects. And least recent studies are going on with gene therapy and tissue engineering to replace the bladder. And this is something which has shown some exciting promise in animal models, not yet tried in human models. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much.